sorry, gentlemen, this is not proving parallelograms. This is, yeah, sorry, this is proving parallelograms. Well, what proves parallelogram, gentlemen? Well, remember, thinking about yesterday's lesson, going back here, I'm going to go check our notes for 7.2. Um, going back into that lesson, we had a series of bullet points where we had the opposite angles, the opposite sides congruent, diagonal that's created, uh, creating two congruent triangles, and we have uh, consecutive angles that are supplementary, and of course, if one angle is right, then all are going to be right. Okay? So, um, this reasoning is going to carry over and thinking about how we can and um oops i'm going to go ahead and copy this right here just so we can look at this as we're working um so thinking about these principles how we could actually use these to uh to, to solve and prove, especially if we're working with an coordinate plane or just have a uh, you know mere conjecture about a quadrilateral and try to supply proof, uh, evidence of proof that something is in fact a parallelogram, right? So here's what we have. Um, here's what we have. Um, the opposite angles are congruent, okay? So again, we don't have anything necessarily that we can show in a coordinate plane. However, if we're going to say the opposite sides are congruent, because remember, when something is a parallelogram, two things are going to be true. One, the opposite sides are going to be parallel, and also the opposite sides are going to be congruent in that quadrilateral. So if it's parallel, we can actually do the slope, right? And if it's that the opposite sides are congruent, we can do the distance formula, okay? So um, just wanting to think about this because I, I believe the superior way to consider um, a, a quadrilateral is not whether or not, because you know we, we discussed this last week uh, in person, the default quadrilateral, and that's come up before in this class, that you have in your mind is a square, and it's just the way that you've been programmed since you were a little kid. Um, a, a square is a very specific instance of, quadril of parallelogram. It's a very specific instance of a quadrilateral. Um, a parallelogram is going to be a little bit more broad and I think is maybe the better uh, default for us to consider with a four-sided figure, okay? So, let's take a parallelogram here. It's S, T, U, and V with the following dimensions, 24 minus X, X plus 6, 2X plus 3, and Y. Okay, so, oops, so the question being, what are, goodness, really struggling here guys, What are the values of x and y that make S to U V a parallelogram? Now, I would never say S U T V, right? Because um, and it has nothing to do with the issue of it being alphabetical. It has to do with the way this thing is set up, either clockwise or counterclockwise, right? S T U V, right, is going to mean it's going to go S to T to U to V, right, and then back to S again, all right. Um, so just consider that. Um, that's really our, our main consideration here. So if we're going to figure out that these guys are going to be congruent, what we need to first of all solve for is uh, x. Now, if this is the case, it means that s, t, and u, v are going to have the same measure. If they do, what it means is that 24 minus x is going to be the same as x plus 6. Okay, and then we can actually just solve from there. We're going to add x to both sides, right? Which is going to give us um, 2x plus 6 on the right, and then 24. 
And then, of course, we're going to subtract 6 from both sides. 24 minus 6 is 18, and that's 2x. So 9 is our value for x, okay? Now, since we have that, again, this guy, we know that tu is going to be congruent to sv, or in other words, that 2x plus 3 is going to be equal to y. Now, we have an equation in two variables. Since we know the value of x, we can actually just plug this guy in here. So we have a 9, I'm sorry, 2 times 9, Add that back to 3, which is y. So 2 times 9, which is 18, plus 3, is going to be a 21. And now we have our two values for x and y. Okay? So, continuing on. We're only going to really worry about a few of these, and then we're actually going to take this over to the coordinate plane, which is where this gets a little bit challenging. Okay, so um, within this uh, quadrilateral, which we will call C, D, E, F, okay, what we have here constructed are two diagonals, which is the maximum number of diagonals that I have. Now, if this is the case, and this side right here is equal to 4, or this segment right here, right, with midpoint, um, I call this midpoint M. So 4x minus 11 is that segment, CM, and ME is equal to 2x plus 17, okay? And we know that CDEF is a parallelogram. And we're going to find the value of x. Are those congruent? Those segments right there? Well, let's go back. Back to the beginning. Remember what we had said here. If we have a diagonal, it's going, to be, it's going to create two congruent triangles. The other thing that we need to make sure that we uh, establish is that uh, diagonals will bisect each other, right? Now, this came up yesterday, right? This had to do with when we uh, did the... Um, when we did the midpoint formula for the diagonal, right? If we had coordinates for... Uh, C, D, E, and F. And if these guys are going to bisect each other, what it means is that F, M, and M, D are going to be congruent the same way that C, M, and M, E are going to be congruent. Okay? That's not saying that all those lines are going to be congruent to each other. It's just that the, each of those is going to be bisected. Therefore, uh, M is going to function as the midpoint for each diagonal, creating two sets of congruent segments. So here, we know that C, M, and M, E are going to be congruent. And then actually just from there, we're going to solve. This is one of those, th those problems that I really hope, after all this time, especially with Algebra 1 and pre-algebra, that we're, uh, we're, we're pretty competent at, right? So again, we're going to add 11 to both sides. You can do this other way, right? You can add, subtract the 2x first, if you'd like. Um, 17 plus 11, of course, after you punch it into your calculator or do it in your head, is going to be... 28, and subtract 2x from both sides. So 2x is going to be equal to 28. So x, when you divide 28 by 2, is 14. Okay? So, again, ways to prove it parallel. Excuse me, prove a parallelogram. One opposite sides are parallel. Opposite sides are congruent. Opposite angles are congruent. Okay? Here's one more set. One more way to go about this. Okay, so we just brought up, um, again, if you didn't get this earlier in your notes, uh, the diagonals. But um, one more thing to prove these guys, okay, is uh, to be parallelograms, it works like this. Oops. You have one pair of opposite sides 
parallel and congruent. Okay? Let's talk about this guy right here, that one pair of opposite sides that's both parallel and congruent. Okay? It's this. If I have this parallelogram, okay? Here's what will prove him parallel as a parallelogram. This guy looks like a parallelogram right now, right? Well, we've talked about the following. We could have this, right? Where by definition, the very basic definition is that two of the opposite sides, both sets, are going to be parallel to each other. You could prove this through slope. Okay? Next. Oops. Let's get back to my cam again. Oop. I need the software to fix my parallelogram. Okay. Next. If we were to say that these opposite sides are congruent, right? You could do this through uh, what formula in a coordinate plane? But distance. Okay. Next, we could prove opposite angles are going to be congruent. Okay. Uh, we don't have a way to do this so far in the coordinate plane. Okay. But we could actually see this if we were given angle measurements. Next is that we have these diagonals, right? That we said are going to be congruent. Okay. Le last way to do it is this: it's that if I have opposite sides that are parallel and they're congruent, but I know nothing about the other two sides, this is going to be sufficient proof as well. All right. And again, what this has to do with is if we were to create that diagonal. Well, we, all we need, right, is if we have these guys both parallel and congruent, we're going to do this through CPCTC, right, the corresponding parts, which eventually are going to prove that this guy and this guy are also going to be congruent, which makes our proof of the parallelogram. Watch this. So I have a side, and then if I have these guys as um, parallels, it creates, or it makes the diagonal create a uh, alternate interior angles. So look at what I have here. I have a side that was given. I have the angle that's alternate interior. And then I have the reflexive side, this guy right here, that's going to effectively create two congruent triangles. Because these two triangles are congruent, it means all their corresponding parts are going to be congruent, right? So that's the way to go through that uh, particular proof, okay? So all we really need is information about one side. One set of parallels is not sufficient. Counterexample, okay? If I were to create a parallelogram, oops, that's a really lousy one. This is just, a, for example, you don't need to write this down. And I only know that this guy and this guy are parallel. Well, think about this. Could I create a quadrilateral, right, where this guy and this guy are parallel? Is that possible? And it is, right? But the other two sides are not parallel. Very possible. So that singular counterexample, of course, foiling um, that. Gentlemen, here is our default way to prove a parallelogram in a coordinate plane. It's our parallelogram test. We have A, which is the origin, B, which is uh, 4, negative 2, C, which is 2 comma negative 4, and D, which is negative 2 comma negative 2. Think about all of the ways we could prove this guy. Think about what we just discussed, okay? With that diagram that I just went through on that video. Should we go back here? Take a look at this. Of all the tests that I could do here, this one we can't really do a formula for, but sides we could do the distance formula. Diagonal creating two congruent triangles, okay? Well, that's interesting. Uh, this we need some sort of angle measurement. This one we need an angle measurement. 
diagonals bisect each other is interesting because by, by, by bisecting, people think, oh, that means that it's gonna, they're gonna have two different sets of distances, so we'd have to do four distance formulas. Remember what we did yesterday. Remember what the outcome was. It wasn't at the midpoint, because the midpoint, if they match both diagonals, then that is a shared midpoint, which means that both of those diagonals are bisected at the same place, fulfilling this, okay? Opposite sides parallel and congruent, right? Opposite sides parallel was the very first way that we could have, that we were given through the definition of a parallelogram, and we'd have to do slope. So here are your choices. Here are your choices. We can use slope of the sides. We could use uh, distance of the sides. Or can't we also use the midpoint? And that's of the diagonals. And you're gonna see a trend here where the, di the differentiating factor for quadrilaterals is actually not the sides for us. It's going to be at the diagonals. This is the, I think, the most efficient way for us to solve this problem. It's the least amount of work because it's the least amount of calculations. This is four slope calculations. This is four distance formulas versus this is merely two um, midpoints, okay? Now, what they have to give us is um, we can either graph this or they've given us the A, B, C, D is the name of this thing. And if that's the case, is it, is A, B, C, D a parallelogram. Do you know why that's brilliant? I'm not going to grab a single thing. I don't want to. I don't think it helps me. I think it just creates more work. You know why? Because here are your diagonals. AC and BD. Correct? Because it, and how do I know that? Well, it's because it's every other one. If it's listed as AB, those are consecutive sides, right? Or consecutive vertices creating a side. If A skip B go to C, that's non-consecutive in a parallelogram, that will be a diagonal. There's only two of them. Brilliant. So in other words, this is what I'm gonna care about right now. Do the midpoint formula. Zero plus two over two over zero minus four over two, which winds up being zero plus two is two, over two is one, negative four over two is negative two, that's one midpoint, and then we're gonna do BD, and it's gonna be really quick, okay? Four minus two over two, comma, negative two minus two over two, right? Sum of the X's divided by two over the sum of the Y's divided by two, okay? Circle my midpoint for AC. No, four minus two is two, divided by two is one. Two, mi negative two minus two is negative four, divided by two is negative two. Guys, look what happened right there. The answer here is yes. That gigantic explanation turned into a very quick calculation. Gentlemen, I'm trying to head off the question that I'm gonna have, which is why does that work, <laughs> right? Or why did you do that? Um, uh, if you if you don't if you didn't follow any of that explanation leading up to it, just just go back here and just know you're going to do the midpoint for a uh, formula for just the diagonals. Just ignore the sides, because what we've deduced here is this is the most efficient way for us to go about this problem. And all of us are lazy and want to do the least amount of steps. Right? That's what I'm after here. So here you guys go. There's other ways to do it, of course. Um, you may be asked to do it a specific way, but pretty much what I'm after here is uh, you guys um, doing the midpoint formula. Now, you will have some problems where they're not gonna list uh, this and give you that it's A, B, C, D, and it goes in that order. You may have to graph it to give yourself a sense. Be careful, don't just say it looks like a parallelogram. You will still need to give me deductive proof, which comes in the form of the midpoint calculation. Okay, your assignment's posted on campus. Good luck.